From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. For 17 months, former North Providence Town Councilman Paul Carancy wore a wire for the FBI, secretly recording phone calls and meetings with three of his corrupt town council colleagues. It was a high profile case that shook North Providence to its core. Councilman John Zamborano, Raymond Douglas, and Council President Joseph Birchfield eventually all pleaded guilty to charges. They sold their votes for cash, and the political trio was shipped off to prison. In his first television interview about the investigation, Carancy talks about his role undercover and how his life was changed forever. Unnamed herein, but whose identity is known to the grand jury, was an elected member of the town council. Now it says what is unnamed herein? CS number one. Who is CS number one? That was me. And for a long time, your identity was always CS number one, but you also had a, uh, you, you were given another nickname by the FBI. What was it? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, the code name, I guess, was Coupon. Your code name was Coupon. Yeah. Do you know why they I named you that? I have no idea why. I wasn't <laughs> too happy about it and didn't use it much. <laughs> well, you're no longer CS number one. Uh, you are Paul Carancy, uh, former town councilman uh, from North Providence, and you blew the doors out this investigation. You not only cooperated, but you're the one that went to the FBI to start this whole thing. Is that right? That's right. You'd already always suspected some stuff was going on. In fact, the year prior, you had visited with the FBI. Uh, you just walked into their office. Right. But this is where you had had enough. You came home and you talked to your wife. Yep. Yeah, and um, like I said, I vented to her, and uh, she finally she listened to me for about maybe a half hour, and, and then said, "Well, you know, maybe it's time to go back to the FBI." And um, I looked at her kind of in disbelief that she was suggesting that because I knew the implications um, of, of doing that, what they would be. I mean, I feared that it would, uh, if I did that, it would cost me my job possibly. Um, I knew that there would be people in town that would refer to me as a rat from that point forward. I knew that uh, I would lose some friendships that I've had for 20, 30, 40 years because they would disapprove of what I'd done. Um, and I knew there would be all kinds of implications, not only on me, but on my family, my wife, my kids. So um, I wanted to be sure that she really meant when she said, it's time to go to the FBI. And we talked about it. We discussed all of the uh, things that could happen, probably would happen. And at the end of it all, uh, we, we both concluded that if I didn't go to the FBI only to protect the lifestyle that I was living at the time, then I really wasn't acting any differently than those I suspected of uh, soliciting and taking bribes. They were doing it to improve their lifestyle. I would have been allowing it to continue only to you know, either enhance mine or maintain my lifestyle. And I, I thought that'd be equally wrong. Mm. A violation of the fiduciary trust that was placed in me as a councilman and the very oath that I uh, took to uphold the uh, town charter of the state and federal constitutions. Do you think if your wife hadn't pushed you in that moment, we'd be sitting here right now? Probably not. Um, I don't think this is a step, knowing uh, the impact that this could have potentially had, and in fact did have on my life and my family, um, I don't know if it's a step I would have been willing to take without her mm -hmm. approval and consent. Eventually you met with an FBI agent for the first time in Cranston. Yes. Were you nervous? Extremely. When, when I it was at Panera's um, bread in, uh, on Reservoir Avenue, and when I walked in, my knees were knocking, my legs were shaking, um, just at the thought of having to meet with someone from the FBI. I had my wife with me for support, and I'm glad I did. Now, eventually, the conversation uh, took a turn, and uh, you, you met with them a second time, and they, they needed you to do something for them. What was it? They asked me to wear a wire so that I could get the proof that they needed to convince a judge. Wear that a wire? I mean, what was your initial reaction to that? I was scared to death, and it, it was really um, not something that I wanted to do, and it was, uh, I knew it was something that wouldn't be looked upon favorably. How long did it take for you to come around? 
I was um, at the same meeting that I agreed. It was later in the same meeting where I was asked to wear a wire that I agreed to. First, I offered um, three or four different suggestions on how they could get the evidence they needed without me wearing a wire. But it came down to I, I had to or there was no way to really stop this. Do you feel that they pressured you in any way? No. They, they simply told me that it's what it would take to stop what was going on. And um, after thinking about it and realizing that they were right and there was no other way to really stop it, um, I knew I had to do it. The first thing you did was a uh, phone call, if that is right, if I remember correctly. And I want to play for you a portion of that phone call, if I could. Why do you guys include me in this stuff? Who was talking to Father about uh, the, you? You and, and Ray and, and Joey? You tricked John Zambrano in that phone call. I did. How? Well, I wasn't present during that conversation, and uh, that was something that was told to me secondhand. But I knew that John probably wouldn't realize that I wasn't present. We were together earlier in that same evening, so I knew with the passage of some time, that conversation not being very important to him at the time, where he would recall it months later or weeks later, and the fact that he had some drinks in him, I knew that he, he wouldn't realize it took place after our dinner and not during our dinner. So I was pretty much able to convince him that I overheard the conversation. Was, was there an FBI agent with you during that phone call? There were two with me. What was the level of success here then? Because, you know, if we were to play that entire phone conversation, he never spilled the beans here. He never uh, said, all right, we'll cut you in. That's not how this phone call ended. So right. why was it a success then? Well, I, I think it was clear through the hesitation in his voice that there was something going on, and he just wasn't sure how to respond to me. So I think that gave a, a level of comfort to the FBI that, in fact, there was a problem here. There was an issue. Um, but more importantly, it set into motion the things John needed to do to uh, actually get me to become a part of the conspiracy, and that was to convince the other two uh, counselors that I knew what was going on, and uh, I think at one point he said to them, I actually give him credit for coming to me with this as opposed to going somewhere else with the information. The orders from the FBI were you had to record all phone conversations from here on out. Yes. Um, and some something went wrong one time when you were on a trip in Washington, D.C. You were supposed to record a conversation. What happened? Yeah, not my finest moment. Um, I had a recorder and uh, I got a call from John, presumably the call where he was going to say, I talked to the others and you're in, you're, you're part of the conspiracy with us. And I um, was so nervous that I must have hit the play button as opposed to the play and record button simultaneously <laughs> on the recorder. So the conversation ended up not being recorded. Fortunately, it wasn't the critical conversation where he was letting me into the conspiracy. It was just something uh, of less importance. But you must have had to report to the FBI that you had a phone call. I did. Did you tell him you screwed up? I, I uh, no. <laughs> I, um, I was so embarrassed that I, I botched such a, an elementary uh, task that I was um, embarrassed to tell him, so I just told him that I received the, the call uh, unexpectedly and it didn't go into voicemail. I had to take the live call. So you lied to an FBI agent? I did. <laughs> <laughs> I assume you fessed up at a certain point. I, I did. Just a few days or a week or so later, I, I told him the truth. <laughs> uh, I felt so guilty about lying to him over it that I had to tell him the truth, but I was embarrassed even telling the truth. Um, before we get to another clip, you know, overall, you have described your involvement in this and recording these calls. The word you used to me was distasteful, and that sort of struck me. Why, why did you use that word? Well, because um, recording people and setting them up this way to uh, make me part of the conspiracy as I had to do wasn't something that I relished. It's not something that um, people are taught to do. Mm. And it is distasteful. It's, um, it goes pretty much against every instinct in my body to have to, you know, do something like that to other people. All right, I want to play another clip for you, if I could. 
So you come tomorrow night, I mean, if you go along with the show and vote for everything, we'll give you $4,000. It's 20 I mean, I negotiated this deal, I mean, and they were in on it from the beginning. At this point, you're in deep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this was that moment in which you were now inserted in, into the conspiracy, correct? Yes. This is not clearly from the sound. This is not a phone call. This is an in-person recorded conversation. Uh, describe where you were, what happened, and explain to people, this was actually supposed to be a video recording. Yes. Um, this conversation, I believe, was on February 9th, the day before the council meeting. I had just returned from Washington uh, at a conference that I was attending, and um, I had to meet with John so he would let me know after speaking to the others if they were going to allow me to become part of the plan. And uh, we were meeting at Dunkin' Donuts, Originally, John told me that he wanted to uh, meet at Dunkin' Donuts but take a ride. And I was concerned as to where we might go and if I, if I would, it would be found out that I was recording the conversation. And there was literally a wire running from the button of your shirt down to some sort of like hard drive. Is that a way yeah, the, the wire ran down the front of my shirt and into my pants and then a little hole was cut in my uh, pant pocket and the wire was inserted up through that and attached to a recording device that was in my pocket. So if someone frisked you, they'd find it? Easily. Yeah, I had both a wire they would feel and then attached to the, to the device. So your blood pressure was high? Oh, I was nervous beyond belief, and I was quite fearful for my life at that point. When we come back, the aftermath of being an FBI source and hear from the lead special agent on this case speaking for the first time. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Paul Carinci wore a wire for the FBI for nearly a year and a half. The evidence gathered ultimately took down three corrupt town councilmen. Coming up, Carinci talks about life after it was revealed he was a federal source. But first, we hear from the lead investigator from the case, FBI Special Agent James Pitkavich. It seems to me if Paul Carancy weren't a part of this case, it wouldn't have happened. So how important was Paul Carancy to this case? Paul, Paul was extremely important to this case. How so? If, I mean, he, here's a guy that he didn't, he didn't have anything hanging over him, right? I mean, that, that's correct. He did not have anything hanging over him. So he didn't need to do this? That, that is correct. Why do you think he did? I, I think he, is, he was somebody who is, is very committed to doing the right thing for... Um, for the citizens of North Providence and for Rhode Island. Were you surprised? I mean, he told me he was a little apprehensive uh, to, to do what you, what you had asked, to, to wear a wire, um, but it was in that meeting he decided to do it. Were you surprised he was so willing to do that? Do you see that very often? I don't think from, from the get-go that he was, he was willing to wear a wire. Uh, my recollection is that he he wanted to think about what the what his role was going to be and what the consequences may be uh, after the case was over. Ultimately, when he came back to you and said, uh, "I'm ready to do it," what was your reaction? I, I was happy. I mean, I thought he wanted to to do the right thing and, and, and bring out any corruption that he may have uncovered. And I think wearing a wire is is the right way to to move forward in, in investigating that type of uh, criminal activity. From this, this point on, correct me if I'm wrong, the FBI told you you had to record every conversation from here on out. That process was cumbersome, wasn't it? Oh, it was such an intrusion in my life you can't even imagine. More than I ever thought possible. Um, I had to record any conversation I had with John Zambrano, Joe Birchfield, or Ray Douglas. And that was in person or on the phone. So every time I received a phone call, I had to let the phone call go into voicemail, call the FBI agent, let him know that I received the phone call. He would give me permission to start the recording device. I would then have to start the device, enter a preamble in, you know, this is Paul Carancy, uh, the date, time. the time, and who I was going to talk to. Um, then return the phone call. If the call went right through and it was picked up, that would be great. If not, then it would go into his voicemail. Then I would have to call Jim back 
and tell them it went into voicemail. We would agree to leave the recorder running for maybe five, six minutes. If I didn't get a call back at that time, I'd deactivate the device, have to do a post um again, who I was, time, date, and uh, what happened, you know, the no return phone call or whatever. And then the whole thing would start over when the phone call did return. Um, if I was able to get through to him, uh, to whoever I was calling back, then I would simply call Jim, let him know that the phone call was successful. He would tell me to deactivate the device. I would do the post amble and shut the recorder down. Then at the end of each call, or at least each day, if there were sometimes more than one call in a day, several times, um, but at the end of each day I would have to meet with Jim, give him the device back. Uh, he would take it to his office and download the conversations, clean it, give it back to me, and I'd start over the next day. This went on for 17 months, mm. and it was um, a, you know, just an amazing intrusion. Sometimes I was at dinner with family or friends, or, and I couldn't pull out the device in front of them, so I'd have to excuse myself and go somewhere that was private, make sure I had cell phone reception, and, uh, and do all of this, and try to still maintain the normal life that everyone else expected that I was maintaining. Was there ever a moment when you thought, I can't do this anymore. Oh, there, there was. Um, one uh, moment in particular that I, I don't think I, I told you about um, was uh, when Jim found out that I was writing things down. From the very beginning, Jim instructed me not to take any notes, not to write anything. He, he knew I liked to write, but he instructed me not to write anything because um, at some point, any notes I take might conflict with the official record and then that would just uh, cast my whole, um, you know, everything I would say into some doubt. So, um, and I'm sure there were other reasons too that he didn't tell me, but that was the biggest reason he gave me. But I write as a way to come to grips with my feelings. And I was doing things here that I told you I wasn't very um, happy about doing. I found them very distasteful. So I would write just to kind of cathect with my own thoughts and, and uh, kind of explain my feelings in writing. And that would make me deal with it better. And it gave me a, it relieved stress and it gave me a different comfort level. Well, one, at one point, um, maybe a couple, three months in, he said to me, uh, now Paul, you're not writing anything down, right? And I said, um, I didn't answer him. And he waited a few seconds, and he looked at me again and said, you're not writing anything down, right? And I said, well, I, I, I might be writing some things down. And he went off the wall. He started yelling at me and um, saying how I, I may have just cost myself immeasurable, uh, undue, unnecessary um, stress and harm because everything that I wrote was now... I have to hand it over to him and he'd have to give it to the defense at some point and uh, it was discoverable and um, every word that I wrote they could take the opportunity to question and what might have been maybe an hour or two on a witness stand might turn into two or three days mm -hmm. because they would have so much more material to question me about <clears throat> so he was really upset and I was stressed out beyond belief and um, he, he yelled at me for, I mean, I say yell, he wasn't, you know, irrational, but he was visibly upset, and, and he let me know it in no uncertain terms, in a loud voice, that he was upset. And I had had enough, and I, I said, you know, I'm done. You, you got the tapes, you got the evidence you need, I'm out of here, I'm all done, I'm not doing this anymore. And I asked him to get out of my car, and he said, you know, calm down, and, and I said, no, I'm done get out, I'm, I'm all done. And he got out of my car and I left. And I was determined not to <laughs> call him back again. Uh, you know, I was in a unique position because I think many people who do what I have done probably have uh, done something wrong themselves. And they're doing, you know, they're cooperating to cut themselves a better deal. I wasn't in that position. And I knew I could stop at any point and there's nothing they could do. So I had had it and that was it. And I went home and I told my wife that I was all done. I wasn't doing this anymore. Jim called me the next day and asked me if I would meet with his boss. 
What did you say to him to get him to dive back into the case? I would say that you know public corruption cases are often complex and, and long, and, and sometimes people wonder whether or not they're doing the right thing. Uh, Paul again had been very committed to this case, and I think it was just a matter of reinvigorating him. What would have happened if he had backed out at that point? Uh, the outcome could have been different. How? Um, we may not have been successful. We may not have had as the number of convictions that we had. Uh, as a result of wearing the wire or, or moving forward and completing the investigation. Uh, were there ever any scary moments? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, very, very scary. Well, the, the meeting that took place on February 9th with John was mm -hmm. a, a very scary time for me because I, I thought we were going to, John said he wanted to take a ride, and I thought he might take me to meet one of the other principals in the conspiracy and that I would be frisked and... Um, the wires would be found, and you know, they might do some serious damage to me, if not kill me. What was life like for you after people realized you were the one that cooperated with the FBI? It was uh, different, very different. And I knew from the moment I got the phone call, I was in Baltimore attending a conference with my wife. It was her conference, and I was just uh, there for vacation. But from the moment I got the phone call, I knew life would be different, and it was. Um, Initially, there was a, a plethora of phone calls from news media everywhere, uh, national and, and throughout the state, print and, and um, TV, and uh, they all wanted to know what happened. Uh, I didn't take any of those calls. I let them go into voicemail. Um, I was my, my only comment would have been no comment anyway, so it didn't seem uh, worthwhile to take any of the calls. And um, I got calls from a lot of friends, some saying, uh, I hope you're not the cooperating witness that was described. And uh, They said, I hope you're not the cooperating yeah, witness. Well, I, I think they were saying that for my sake, knowing that life would be irre irrevocably changed at that point and just wanting to protect me and hoping that it wasn't me. And I, I couldn't confirm to them that it was either. Um, so uh, that kind of thing happened. I got um, some hate mail from people who assumed it was me. And like you say, process of elimination, it was pretty clear it was me. Uh, I got hate mail. Um, I got uh, many phone calls, uh, people just, you know, uh, trash talk and then hanging up, uh, never identified themselves. I also got a lot of support, people saying they did the, think I did the right thing and uh, supporting me. But, you know, for every 10 calls you get, nine uh, showing support and one that, that um, is, is not pleased, that's the one you remember, and that's the one that has the impact. Um, my family got a death threat, only one. Uh, we Have they ever tracked down who sent that? No, I gave the information to the FBI, but apparently they weren't able to figure it out. Uh, I, um, I had my house vandalized a couple of times. I had uh, my cars vandalized many times, and um, I've had tires slashed, nails thrown in my driveway and in front of my house where I park. Had to deal with a, a lot of flat tires uh, on all of our cars, not just mine. My, uh, my sons, my daughters who were living me, with me at the time, my wife's car, my mother-in-law who lives with me, her, car, her tires, one of her tires was slashed, uh, I think three months ago, two or three months ago. So this is still going on? It still continues, yeah. Um, and uh, I had friends that I had been friends with for 20, 30 years that stopped talking to me. Why did they stop talking to you? They just felt that what I did was wrong. Have you been called a rat? Oh, God, yeah. How yeah. The very first council meeting I attended, there was somebody there holding up a Chuck E. Cheese sign, and he, he made a comment that uh, Chuck E. Cheese was back on the council bench. You're leaving not just the town, but you're leaving the state. You're going to Indiana for a new job. Uh, did all of this play a role in your leaving? I, I think um, I'm not leaving because of what happened, but uh, um, my inability to get a good job here, I think, is a direct result of what I did. Why can't you get a good job? Do you think because everyone knows that you cooperated? Yeah. Uh, you know, everybody wants to say you did the right thing, good job, took a lot of guts. But having you on staff where there's a fear that you might do it again at some point is not something people are willing to deal with apparently. So uh, they're reluctant to hire me. 
They don't trust you. Pretty much. So five years later, was it worth it? Well, you know, from a personal perspective, it might not have been. I mean, the things I had to endure as a result of it, um, maybe not. But in, in the greater realm, I think it certainly was worth it. And if I had to uh, tomorrow, I would do it again. I wouldn't change anything. My thanks to Paul Carancy and Special Agent James Pitkavich for telling their story. This investigation continues online. Use our interactive timeline to track the North Providence corruption case. Plus, you can see where the key players are now and even hear secret FBI recordings for yourself. It's all online, WPRI.com. I want to thank you for watching. I'm Tim White, and we'll see you next week on Newsmakers.